Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, delighted to uh, be here to speak with Matt Mullenweg, who uh, has had a huge impact on the development of the web uh, uh, over the last decade. Uh, WordPress uh, was one of the seminal publishing tools uh, that really drove a lot of innovation uh, and I think continues to drive a lot of innovation. Uh, so maybe just to start out, Matt, if you could tell us a little bit, I mean, you, you took what was essentially an open source blogging tool. Mm -hmm. Now you've got a company that's uh, worth over a billion dollars. You raised, what, 160 million a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the kind of, what is the business plan from here? Like, where do you, where do you take it that justifies, you know, that kind of valuation and makes sure. money for, for those That's a investors. really excellent question. More people <laughs> should ask that. <laughs> <laughs> There's, um, well, we're a company that's basically betting on the open web. And uh, that's why Automatic actually, so a lot of our resources go back into supporting the open source WordPress project because we believe that the web needs an open platform uh, just like Android has captured 88% of mobile devices and things like that. We think that there will be a Cambrian explosion of creativity, not unlike the early 2000s when you know, net neutrality roamed the world and the web was open and your <laughs> we'll, browser we'll get, could we'll visit different that, sites. Yeah. And like, <laughs> yeah. uh, if, if we are able to create something that creates a great user experience, uh, that gives people the power and flexibility they want, and provides the freedom that I think people deserve. And we can help build a web that I would love future generations, including maybe my own, to grow up in. Mm -hmm. So, so you're, you're, you believe you can get kind of orders of magnitude more people on your platform to create whatever they're creating with WordPress? Yeah, I think we can take it from 28 or not 29% to something more in sort of the 80, 90% range at the same time that the web is going to continue to grow as another six and a half billion people come online. Mm -hmm. How much of that growth is, is outside of the U.S.? Uh, most of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's, why, that's another place where open source can be really powerful. So mm -hmm. WordPress is translated and localized in languages that there would be no commercial reason uh, to go to, including Klingon, <laughs> uh, which actually is a high per capita <laughs> income rate for Klingon <laughs> speakers. But, the, uh, it's just, but it shows kind of when you are able to create a platform and a movement, not just a product. It doesn't just benefit one company, it benefits a whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. For every dollar that Automatic makes, 20 or $21 are made by the other companies in the WordPress ecosystem. So that is, all those things that we just talked about are deliberate. Like if you study, uh, if you look at the Windows 95 launch, Windows is a dominant platform back in the 90s for the younger crew. Um, <laughs> That, that's one of the things they talked about when Windows 95. They had this crazy launch, people lined up around the world, like the Rolling Stones wrote a song or something. I don't, I don't remember it they all. They bought the Rolling Stones song. But yeah. <laughs> they bought the Rolling Stones <laughs> yeah, song. Yeah. But they talked about that. For every dollar that we make, $20 is made in Windows ecosystem. And it turns out that for really successful platforms, that ratio happens. Um, right now, in certain platforms, like let's say Facebook, for every dollar that's made on Facebook, um, like. 99 cents goes to Facebook. <laughs> right, right, <laughs> I mean, not quite, right, I'm exaggerating. Right. But you know, Facebook and Google are taking a disproportionate amounts of uh, air out of the room, particularly in new advertising growth, to the detriment sometimes of journalism and other platforms. An independent platform is what the web needs. Sorry, I keep coming back to that. And so you know, need and, and, and can exist are not necessarily the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, A lot of people, I think, would, would say, well, the independent web is it's kind of over, right? I mean, Facebook, Google, you know, these big platforms just kind of run everything, right? I mean, how, how, do, you, how do you kind of negotiate that kind of ecosystem where? I mean, I'll take that know. bet. <laughs> the, I believe, we definitely go through cycles. Um, there was a point uh, not that long ago when instead of a URL on a billboard, someone put an AOL keyword. You know, mm -hmm. obviously that hasn't aged well. But we might look back at some of the current things that we do um, in the same fashion. And we've already had a few cycles of you know, people investing millions and millions of dollars to buy followers on Facebook and then finding that they had to pay to reach those followers or that when the algorithm changes, that changes your entire distribution mechanism. So we do have this kind of idea, and it's, a, it's an old idea. You know, we're in this beautiful music hall. Uh, musicians learn that you have to own your masters. Mm -hmm. um, we have a 
kind of generation, which I think is growing up and learning sometimes uh, from the mistakes of the past and sometimes the hard way, that if you don't control your digital destiny, your digital online um, home, that you're really at the whim of these other parties whose business model is going to change, whose priorities are going to change, and is likely not aligned with yours. And would you apply that criticism to Medium, for example, which I think is one yeah. of your competitors? Well, Medium, I think, is a good product, but I don't think it's going to be a platform. You know, there's, even with their subscription service, too much of the value is going to Medium, where, you know, if you break out, if you're a great publisher, like, let's say, in tech, we have, like, the information or Stratechery or something like that, they're not going to want to be on Medium's platform because Medium is sort of a useless middleman there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's part of the struggles that they hit, that you mm -hmm. can get to kind of like a, in like the Forbes or HuffPo model where you have lots of publishers and like there's professionally paid for stuff and amateur stuff, you can get to a pretty good user base. But I don't know if you can create a huge business on top of that, mm -hmm. particularly if you're trying not to be, was it a platisher or platform oh, yeah, publisher? Platisher. Yeah, yeah. It was a terrible portmanteau, so <laughs> let's, let's not use that word again. Right. Um, so if I heard you right a second ago, were you suggesting that we're, we're now sort of at the, at the peak of the dominance of the big platforms and that that's going to kind of ebb over time? Well, I think that the industry is already having a natural reaction um, to closed ecosystems. Open source uh, eventually dominates every sector it enters. Um, the eventually is the key <laughs> because it can take, sometimes it can happen fairly quickly. I mean, if you look at open source applied to finance, Bitcoin, open source applied to information, Wikipedia, open source applied to uh, content management, WordPress, like these sorts of things that can happen in like less than a decade often become the dominant platform in this space. And then others like say Linux on the desktop might not happen before the sun burns out. <laughs> like, right. There's different sort of, uh, uh, but Android on mobile, which is a Linux based system, 88% market share of devices. So. Yeah, a lot of market share of devices, not much market share of, of business profit. Absolutely. Um, and I, I have and, an and you know, in and in fact, pocket, that, so. that example is a good one because, you know, I remember having this conversation six or eight years ago with, I shouldn't mention his name, but, uh, <laughs> but with a prominent, you know, person in the business who was telling me that, you know, we've seen this movie before, this is like Windows versus Mac all over again, mm -hmm. and, you know, Android is going to win because, you know, open systems always win, and, you know, Apple's screwed, and that was sort of the analysis, and that, you know, was a massively incorrect analysis. <laughs> well, yes. Well, <laughs> depends on how you look at it. Um, open doesn't win just because it's open. Mm -hmm. Open source doesn't win just because it has a more morally superior license. You have to have a better user experience. You have to create real value. Um, I think where it can win over the long term is that ultimately, it can be more aligned with where users are than a company whose whims might change. And these petty fights that the internet giants are having, you know, what is it, the Amazon doesn't they sell Nest sell devices, Comcast and now YouTube won't yeah. stream to your, <laughs> I mean, this is all just, you know, it's, it's petty and it's not user aligned. Mm -hmm. So that's a big advantage that Automatic has a company as well by being Swiss. If you publish, um, you probably, you want as many readers as possible. So you, you probably want to cross post it to Facebook, to Twitter, to LinkedIn, to wherever it is. Um, if you post to just Facebook, it's not going to cross post to Twitter because they're having a fight right now or Instagram and Twitter, like all these sorts of things. So actually having an independent place can be most user aligned over the time. And to the extent that WordPress is, you know, the WordPress project started 14 years ago and is now growing even faster than it ever has in the past. It's to the extent we've been successful, I, I attribute a hundred percent to having the same incentives and being completely aligned with our user base. Mm -hmm. Do you think there, there sort of can or should be uh, kind of other kinds of actions, government action to kind of help the big platforms to uh, lose a little bit of their dominance? It's a weird way to put that, but. Uh. <laughs> um, I think that it would be interesting. I am probably fall a little bit on the side of governments not intervening as much. But there could be something very interesting from the point of view of sort of user-centric regulations. So uh, allowing the setting of defaults, which is a big thing lacking in iOS. Um, allowing and forcing the export of data, 
So mm -hmm. if you put data in, you should be able to get the data out. Mm -hmm. uh, Wix, one of our competitors, doesn't allow you to export. Even Facebook allows you to export, <laughs> and Wix doesn't. So like, there's these different things that uh, could be very user-centric and help privacy, help portability, and everything. And much in the same way that net neutrality could allow future YouTubes and Facebooks to arise, I think that we need to recognize that the network effects of these super locked-in data systems um, create the same sort of uh, monopolies, except our monopoly law, we're, not design we're designed to deal with rising prices. So there, I think, are some tweaks we can make to the frameworks that would make it a more fair and open and more innovative marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you mentioned the user-centric approach. I mean, the European uh, GDPR, the privacy mm -hmm. rules, uh, which you're probably familiar with, that, that would be one example of that kind of approach, right, where you give a lot of rights to the to the individual to control their data? Europe's definitely leading the world in this regard. Um, it's making some mistakes along the way. You've mm -hmm. all probably seen that annoying cookie thing. You go to a website, you have to <laughs> accept the cookie. Like, the intention was right. right. right there. I, think they were, I think they were trying to uh, get rid of retargeting. But how it got implemented was made no difference. <laughs> it right. just annoys everyone. Right. Um, so to, to shift ground a little bit, um, the, you know, you talk about being a, you know, a Switzerland as a, as a publisher and, and uh, you know, aligned with your users, and, and, and I know you don't really impose any kind of restrictions on uh, what happens on the platform. I mean, there's WordPress tools, which anyone obviously mm -hmm. does what they want with, but, but on your platform, you do have the, the ability and arguably the responsibility to have some rules around what kinds of things you can publish. So mm -hmm. how are you responding to the... Uh, kind of current circumstances where uh, people posting, you know, racist, you know, fake news, you know, all kinds of horrible stuff that goes on currently on, on, on the internet. Um, how, do you, how do you approach that? I mean, if somebody, if the Daily Stormer shows up and wants to publish their, their site on your platform, what do you tell them? Hmm. Um, well, to one extent, we do make the open source side of the software. The GPL license allows people to use it for any purpose. Mm -hmm. um, so just like you could print any document with Microsoft Word, people can use the open source version. But at the end of the day, automatic for the things that we host, run, support, um, I have 650 colleagues and we have values and principles and you know, want to be excited as well about the things that we're supporting. Now, as a company, we have a very, very, very strong First Amendment stance and we've gone to court to fight for national security letters. We host uh, one of the sort of largest, we host a lot of academic sites that allow mm -hmm. false takedown notices because they might appear to have terrorist content, but in fact they're legit universities and things discussing uh, content like that. So we do fight things, but at the end of the day we have a terms of use and it does prohibit things like hate speech that many of these sites uh, would run into. So we don't end up running into too much of it on WordPress.com. So, so your, your rules prohibit hate speech? Yeah. <laughs> and so how do, you how do you define that? There's a, there's a whole terms of service team that has a way to do it. So it it's, I should say it's not me arbitrarily deciding things. Mm -hmm. um, it's a team applying rules fairly across languages, across borders, uh, consistently with our terms of service. And they've been doing it now for 12 years. And Pretty well. So, so that's a little bit similar then to what, say, Facebook and Google have, which is that you know they have sort of behind the scenes, there's a bunch of people applying a rule book to decide you know what's okay and what's not. And some um, do it better than others. Like mm -hmm. I'd say, Twitter has definitely been in the news for being semi seemingly capricious in some ways, mm -hmm. where the rules seem not fairly applied to one side or another. Mm -hmm. um, I think any rule is fine as long as it's fairly applied. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the, uh, you know, you, you spoke about the strong free speech stance. I mean, I think that, I think some people would argue that um, that, that sort of purest First Amendment approach that a lot of tech companies have taken, and particularly, you know, Twitter, and, and, and it's, you know, it's a somewhat self-serving kind of stance, actually, mm -hmm. because it absolves you of responsibility for policing things. Um, and I think, you know, I think a lot of people would argue that they that that turned out to be a not viable stance. Um, I mean, Twitter has backtracked gigantically, you know, from where they used to be on on these issues. Um, what was the question? The, the question. <laughs> the, the question is, you know, 
when you, when you say that um, uh, that we take a, a very strong First Amendment stance, mm -hmm. have have recent events you know caused you to rethink that in some fashion? So I think that if you are providing a ton of distribution, so there's hosting, allowing people to publish, and there's distribution, putting something on the front page. And in today's world, everyone has their own personalized front page. So we don't think of it, but the algorithms and the companies and the technologists writing these things have a responsibility, not dissimilar to whoever is choosing what goes on A1 at the New York Times or something. You're doing that equivalent for hundreds of millions and billions of people. So I do think that they should weigh into not just what generates the most engagement or clicks, but the truthiness of it and things like that. Uh, that is more for distribution platforms than necessarily pure publishing platforms, although there is an element that falls to us as well. But if, the, you know, if a blog is published in a forest and no one reads it, like, <laughs> it doesn't make a big deal. It's when like, there's something false that reaches 150 million people before it's taken down that becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? You mentioned earlier uh, net neutrality, and I know that, that you know, this is another kind of article of faith in the business that, that net neutrality is a good thing. Um, assuming that the new plan goes through, um, does that have any real, uh, real world actual impact on your business? Uh, probably, it's a little, the rules are very wonky, and I don't know if I'm probably the best person to comment on it. But, well, okay, so I could take that to say you're not too worried about it. <laughs> because if you were worried about it as the CEO, you'd presumably be up to speed on it, right? Well, I mean, we're lobbying against it. We're, we're fighting on, we try to fight on behalf of the independent web. Because a thing about WordPress is it represents, in a lot of ways, the dark matter of the web. It doesn't show up on the top 10 on Comscore, but in fact, it has traffic equal some of the larger social networks and things. It's just distributed among hundreds of millions of domains. Mm -hmm. So it is important, and we do try, but at the end of the day, it gets aggregated, those domains aggregate into web host, which aggregate into network providers. Which I, you know, so there's, there's lots of layers there, mm -hmm. and at various layers, the new regulations will change different things. Um, the, probably the best long-term thing that we can, and that I personally try to do, is influence the people who will be making these decisions. Like, who is actually in the office that's making the decision? And can they think long term? Mm -hmm. So for, for the immediate term, you know, you're not too worried about, I guess one of the things I'm trying to get at here is that a lot of the rhetoric around net neutrality says that like, oh, you know, independent websites are going to be unplugged, you know, they're mm. going to be throttled, they're not going to be able to afford to, yeah. you know, pay to get into your home and these kinds of things, which I personally find a little bit mystifying. So, so do you, I mean, do you, fear that those kinds of things are going to happen, that sites on your network are not going to be accessible because of bad practices by ISPs? I guess the question becomes, is bandwidth or traffic prioritization a gating factor for the next generation of services being created? And in terms of publishing, like blogs and things, no, it's not. Text and images is not uh, making a huge difference. For video, the next Netflix, maybe. But you really have to get really far on the edge of usage before that becomes a real issue. I think that there's probably been more damage done to innovation from, uh, say, you start to get face popular on the Facebook graph and they shut you off. Mm -hmm. Or you know, the, basically the closing off of the social networks, which have huge network effects and create these national monopolies, and um, closing off of data. Then there has been or will be from the couple of years of bad net neutrality law we will have. My hope is that the ISPs, you know, Comcast of the world, do something really stupid, and then we react with something that kind of enshrines the openness that we want in a more legally long-term way. Mm -hmm. right, great. So I'm hoping they do something bad. <laughs> <laughs> so we've only we've got uh, just another minute, and um, and I wanted to ask you a, a very different kind of question. So, sure. so you live in Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas, yeah. Um, an unusual spot for a tech entrepreneur, I guess. <laughs> um, but you were telling me you had that, that Automatic is a totally distributed company, so everybody works remotely, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and I found that quite interesting, and I'm wondering, like, what are the, because it seems hard to run a big company entirely remotely. Mm. So what, what are your um, kind of, A, sort of lessons from doing that, and B, like, what are the big challenges of doing that? 
Oh, I think it's actually easier. Um, first, you'll get down to hiring and retention. So if you believe, which I do, is that talent is equally distributed among the world, uh, the ability to hire, if you find someone great, to be able to hire them, regardless of where they choose to live or want to work, um, just immediately, is huge. So we can get an incredible talent pool, including some folks who were previously at an internet giant like a Google or a Facebook and say, I just don't want to work there anymore. I just don't want to live in you know, that city anymore. I don't want to commute to Mountain View every day anymore mm -hmm. or San Francisco. So that is a huge, huge, huge help. And then retention, because people can you know, do a lifestyle arbitrage. They can make SF-style salaries anywhere they want. Brazil, mm -hmm. Alabama, Japan, mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. like, you can create a really good life for yourself. And then because of the way remote work works, where a lot of, our, a lot of what we do is asynchronous, actually through the course of the day, you, we, uh, I forget the exact group name, but there's a huge pool in automatic of um, basically mothers who have returned to the workforce. And they can design their day around dropping their kids off, picking their kids up. And if you were in an office, that might be awkward to leave and come mm -hmm. back at those times, even if it had a very progressive policy. Or meetings might get scheduled during that. So by having very few meetings, making most things asynchronous, um, people can function as full, you, don't, you wouldn't know how they're designing their day or what they're doing. So they can really mm -hmm. design their life and work to integrate and bring their best selves to both. And I think that is a huge long-term competitive advantage. And then, you know, when we started, the tools were a little light. We used IRC, <laughs> AIM, I think, we chatted on sometimes. Like, it was definitely a first generation. But today, with Slack, with Zoom for video conferencing, we use P2 instead of email, which is something we wrote. Um, even just FaceTime with someone. Like, you can hear crystal clear, be connected to any person anywhere in the world. Why are we still worried that, oh, if I need to talk to someone, how do I get to them? Mm -hmm. I do think, now, I will say that we balance this, that we work we just flip it, right? Like most companies say, 48 weeks out of the year, be in this one co-located place, and then four weeks of the year, go do whatever. We turn it around. So we say 48 weeks of the year, be wherever you want, and then we tell people to expect three to four weeks of travel for work, and we bring, do meetups. So individual teams of 10 to 20 people will get together two to three times a year, mm -hmm. and we let them go anywhere in the world, and then once a year, we bring the entire company together. Mm -hmm. uh, last year was in, or this year was in Whistler, up in Canada, mm -hmm. so we just find someplace cool. And those bondings are important, because just like you and I have met in person, now we can, if we send an email or text later, right, like it'll have a voice and a tone yeah, and everything. Yeah, like that's, yeah. that's true. It's nice yeah. to be able to break bread with people. But you don't need to do that every day. And in fact, you might get along better with them, like a family reunion effect, mm. if you don't have to see them every day. <laughs> right. OK, that's great. <laughs> OK, so well, that, that's great, Matt. And before you finish, I want to just do one thing here, which, um, uh, which the group, or the, which CB Insights asked for. Uh, for us to do so, I'm going to name, uh, I'm going to state a bunch of things, and you, you tell me if they're underrated or overrated. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're going to go real fast. All right. Bitcoin. Underrated. Blockchain. Underrated. AI. Uh, overrated. Facebook. <laughs> a great partner. <laughs> <laughs> Google. Uh, underrated. Autonomous cars. Uh, underrated. Uber. Overrated. Medium? Yeah, they're, they're a good competitor. <laughs> Twitter? Um, underrated. OK, and this last one is too easy. Blogging. Oh, <laughs> I'm very long on blogging. So. <laughs> yeah, OK. All right, well, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Matt. I really appreciate thank it. Thank you, and thank you all. Um, <laughs>